If you'd like to learn more about the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy or uh, about the UW Madison uh, School of Pharmacy, um, please check us out uh, on um, AIHP.org or uh, Facebook or Twitter. Dr. Emily Dufton uh, joins us today and uh, she's going to talk about her book, Grassroots, The Rise and Fall and Rise of Marijuana in America. And it's published by Basic Books in 2017. And um, as is the norm, I'll just say a couple of words before I turn the floor over to her. Um, for those of you who don't know already, uh, this seminar series, uh, this Kremenar is named after Edward Kremers. Uh, that's um, the second director of the School of Pharmacy, uh, but also a co-founder of the American Institute of History of Pharmacy. We named the seminar after him because he invited critical thought about drug consumption and control in the U.S. He uh, encouraged the news media and politicians as well as pharmacy leaders uh, to think clearly about <clears throat> some of the meanings and assumptions associated with drugs. But he also opposed prohibitionist uh, ideas and impulses as well as prohibitionist organizations arguing that restrictive measures wouldn't necessarily solve the misuse of substances. And in light of what's happening in 2020, uh, I think it's important to emphasize that uh, uh, Kremers resisted um, any sort of policies and language that placed blame on foreigners or on marginalized groups uh, for either crime or drug addiction. So here's why I think it's crucial and just a few data points for you. According to the Pew Research Center, 40% of all US law enforcement drug arrests in 2018 were for cannabis. And 92% of those arrests were for simple cannabis possession and 8% were for growing or transporting cannabis. According to a study by the American Civil Liberties Union, members of the black community and white community use cannabis at about the same rate, but black people are four times more likely than white people to be arrested for cannabis possession. In Minnesota, where George Floyd was killed, black people were uh, arrested at a rate of 8.5 times higher than white people for uh, cannabis possession over the past few years. Obviously, being arrested for cannabis possession can mean a loss of uh, financial uh, aid for education, loss of job, loss of public benefits, loss of access uh, to government programs. Um, another data point for you, police spend $3.6 billion annually on enforcing cannabis possession laws, uh, and this resulted in 800 and 20,000 arrests in uh, 2019. Finally, according to a 2019 Pew Research poll, 91% of Americans support medical or recreational cannabis legalization. Recreational marijuana is legal in 11 states for adults over the age of 21 and is legal for medical use in 33 states, including uh, the recreational states. So just bear that in mind, uh, this, this present situation, uh, as we listen to, uh, listen to the uh, excellent uh, Dr. Dufton, uh, Dufton talk about uh, her book today. Uh, the structure for today's talk is similar uh, to some of the previous uh, uh, discussions. So um, we'll listen to Dr. Dufton uh, for um, as long as she wants to talk, and then we'll have a Q&A. I'll throw my two cents in where possible. Um, but the moderator for today is uh, Dr. Uh, Gregory Bond. He is the assistant director at the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy. He is um, also the uh, senior editor at Pharmacy and History and has published recently a number of um, important works on the history of African Americans in pharmacy. Just so you know, the Q&A box is open uh, and please submit your questions via the Q&A box. Uh, and he's going to take those questions um, and uh, offer those uh, to, Dr., to Dr. Dufton. 
Um, speaking of which, uh, Emily Dufton, Dr. Dufton, uh, received her BA uh, from New York University, and she earned her PhD in American Studies uh, from George Washington University. She's currently a senior research associate uh, at the George Washington University Documentary Center, um, where she's uh, working on um, a multi-part investigative documentary uh, series. She's the managing editor of uh, Points, the blog of the Alcohol and Drug History Society. And uh, she's also a podcast host uh, on the New Books Network. She's appeared on CNN, the History Channel, uh, National Public Radio. Uh, she has been featured in Time Magazine, uh, the Smithsonian Magazine, uh, as well as the Washington Post. Uh, the Boston Herald uh, recently referred to her as, and I quote, an oracle of knowledge on all things marijuana, unquote, which is amazing. It's a really nice thing to be called an oracle. Uh, hopefully we can all be called oracles. Um, she's with us uh, to talk uh, about her book, Grassroots, uh, The Rise and Fall and Rise of uh, Marijuana in America, uh, which traces 50 years of cannabis activism and um, uh, I turn it over to you, Dr. Dustin. Thanks so much. And you're on mute, just so you know. Okay, am I, can you hear me? Cool, all right. Luke, thank you so much for having me. Um, welcome to my, my home office. I'm thrilled to be able to uh, speak to all of you. Uh, thank you so much for attending this. And it's a lot of fun to be able to uh, reach you from across the distance. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here, so thanks so much for this opportunity. And I'm really looking forward to getting down to the kind of quick and dirty of the history of cannabis activism. Two little things before I get started. The first is that I use a wide variety of terms for this plant. I know some people are uh, somewhat upset about uh, using any term other than cannabis uh, because other terms have some racialized histories. I know uh, Chris Duvall probably talked about that last week. I use a variety of terms. I am an equal opportunity name user for, for marijuana, pot, cannabis, etc. I don't mean to insult anyone, but I enjoy using a variety of terms. I feel like it makes it less repetitive. The other thing is that my internet can sometimes get spotty. So if uh, you, if I glitch or whatever, um, hopefully someone at Madison will let me know and I can go back and just repeat what I was saying. Not a problem. So let me go up here and share my slides. Hopefully this will work. Um, all right. Can you see this? Hopefully. Looks great. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm going to go back to viewing it as a presentation. All right, so here we are, Grassroots, the History of Marijuana's Ups and Downs in America. There you can see my Twitter handle. Feel free to follow me online for more fun uh, drug information. And if you want to know more, you can also read my book that uh, Luke very nicely introduced. Uh, it came out a little over two years ago in December 2017. So I almost feel like I need to write a follow-up at this point because so much has happened uh, since the publication of that book. But it is the first history of marijuana activism before and against the drug, uh, because as you'll see, activism and support for and against the legalization and criminalization of marijuana moves as a pendulum back and forth. It was based off my dissertation that I wrote at GW uh, with additional research, and I did over two dozen interviews. So I really tried to get the voices of the participants in this movement um, actively involved in the writing of the book as well. So here we see a map of the most recent status of legalization, decriminalization, and uh, criminalization in the United States. And as Luke was saying, 11 states and Washington, D.C., that fun little dot right there in Maryland, uh, have fully legalized recreational and medical use of the drug. Uh, recreational use for those over 21, medical for those in need. 12 states have a status of uh, medical and decriminalization. 16 states have just medical laws. Three states have some level of decriminalization. 
And there are eight where the drug, they're holding out basically, and the drug remains fully illegal. This is a pretty crazy map if you think about it, because all of these shifts have occurred in just the past 24 years. Only since 1996 at the earliest for med, or since 2012 is the earliest for recreational. And a lot of people have certainly argued uh, online and to me and elsewhere that because of these vast changes in the past you know, two and a half decades, that legalization is absolutely inevitable. And the, the floodgates are about to open. There's no way it's going to remain the status uh, that this drug has been on for so long. Uh, changes, the change is gonna come. And I always hesitate to embrace that logic because history, the history of cannabis in the United States shows that that's not necessarily true. It also really shows just how much America has fluctuated in terms of our acceptance or rejection of legal and decriminalized marijuana, especially when proponents of legalization or criminalization kind of get a little too cocky about their position and assume that they're right and that everything's gonna go their way. So to go back a little bit, travel back five decades now, we can go to August 16th, 1964 in San Francisco, where we actually have the first protest for legalized weed. And it all starts with this man right here, Lowell Eggemeyer. Lowell is the first known legalization activist. And though these photos are not from 1964 when his uh, sort of uh, first work of activism took place, they're from probably about a, a decade later. He wasn't entirely, when he sent me these photos via text message with a lot of emojis, which was fascinating, he said that they're from about the mid 1970s, so about a decade afterwards. And you look at him and you think, maybe this isn't necessarily the kind of person you would expect to be the first marijuana activist, uh, legalization proponent in the United States. But keep in mind that in 1964, we're about five years away, or you know, three years, three years to five years away from the kind of um, caricature of the hippie, the stereotype of the hippie really becoming a large force in American popular culture. So this guy has somewhat longish hair, he has a beard, but he's not the stereotypical hippie. He's not wearing tie dye, he's not wearing beaded vests, things like that. He had short hair, he was a very uh, regular guy, when on that day he walked into the San Francisco Hall of Justice, where uh, the police were also located, lit up a joint, and declared that he was starting a protest to legalize marijuana and wanted to be arrested for his act, which he was, because in California at that time, uh, the possession of marijuana was actually a felony, so he was carted off to jail. What happened after that, I mean, clearly people have been arrested for marijuana possession and use prior to Eggemeyer's actions. But what happened for Eggemeyer essentially transformed the future of marijuana activism in the United States. And that was because he was fortunate enough to have a very influential lawyer take up his case. And his lawyer's name was James R. White III, who took up Eggemeyer's case pro bono. White is a really interesting character in all of this. He was a civil liber libertarian who described himself as to the right of Barry Goldwater, which is fairly intense in 1964, of course, when Goldwater was running for president. And he defended Eggemeyer because he really believed that the individual adult use of cannabis in their own home was not something that the police could enforce as a crime. And he argued this on two counts uh, as far as the Constitution is concerned. He argued it based on the 8th and the 14th Amendments. He said that locking Eggemeyer up for lighting up a joint um, defied the 8th Amendment because it was cruel and, cruel and unusual punishment for such an act. And he also said that it violated the 14th Amendment, uh, which required due process for being tried for a crime. White was also a researcher, and he went through the federal government's official stances on drugs and drug use to find support for his claims. And there was a rich amount of material out there for him. He found things like the Indian Hemp Drugs Commission's report, 
from 1894, the Panama Canal Zone Commission's report from 1925, and the LaGuardia Commission's report from 20 years prior in 1944. And all of these federally researched and federally funded reports found a number of things in common, one of which was that cannabis was overall less harmful for the human body than legal drugs like alcohol and tobacco. Uh, they also found that it was uh, essentially a drug that was being used widely, whether or not it was uh, being criminalized or not. And then all these things sort of like bolstered his argument that the use of, or the punishment of cannabis possession use was unconstitutional, and Egemeyer didn't deserve to be jailed for it. In order to fund his work, White forms a group called LIMAR, which is a conjunction of legalized marijuana, and he starts to put out all of the information uh, that he had found in the LaGuardia Report, in the Panama Canal Zone Commission, the Indian Hemp Drugs Commission, et cetera. He types them up, photocopies them, and starts spreading them around the neo-hippie burgeoning counterculture of the Bay Area in San Francisco. And so in these images, you can see on the left, there's actually a number of copies with some really excellent hand-drawn illustrations on them. Uh, that were being passed around. Uh, on the right, you can see what's called marijuana puffin, and that is actually the transcript of how uh, White was trying to argue for a writ of habeas corpus to get Egemeyer out of jail, which unfortunately didn't work. But all of these people start to become educated about the findings of the federal government over the previous over 50 years, 60 years, about the relative lack of dangers uh, associated with marijuana as opposed to other substances, and the stance of the federal government previously that said, we don't think that this is as much of a problem as the misuse of other substances. Again, this burgeoning counterculture, which is really rising up around the same time, moment of historical kismet for James R. White, this very upstanding uh, civil libertarian to start arguing these things. and you know, promoting this information to a rise in counterculture. So as you can see in the hand-drawn um, poster in the middle, it became associated with Grateful Dead, uh, the charlatans. They started to help end mar marijuana prohibition by uh, ben throwing benefits for Lemar, having concerts, things like that. Really sort of a fascinating uh, conglomeration of all of these forces. And one other individual happened to be in San Francisco at the time, in about December 1964, and that's Allen Ginsberg, who you can see there in the middle of the top, uh, wearing the sandwich board that says, pot is fun. He had just finished up a semester at Berkeley, where he was teaching, and uh, was getting ready to go back to New York when he walked to Union Square and saw a Lemar rally, and was shocked. I mean, to, it, 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 it's hard to it was to have a group of individuals calling for the legalization of marijuana in 1964. It really was unheard of at the time. So Ginsburg sees the rally, meets White, you know, learns about Lemar, and says that this is something that he really wants to uh, work with as well. And when he returns to New York, he turns uh, his area of New York on the, on the Lower East Side into a hotspot of Lemar activism as well. That photo of him in the sandwich board is actually where he is at a protest outside of uh, a detention center where nine people had previously been arrested for uh, cannabis possession. There are a few other hotspots that rise up in support of Lemar nationwide. There was one in Buffalo, there's one in Ohio, it starts to kind of dot the country, but it's not uh, quite the groundswell that it will be later on. Nonetheless, over the rest of the decade of the 1960s, pot starts to essentially explode in the national consciousness, not only on college campuses, where we sort of most associate its use in that decade, but elsewhere as well. The cover of Life magazine uh, in October 1969 actually features a picture of kind of an anonymous, but a white hand holding a joint up to the lips, and the entire issue is dedicated to the examination of the role of cannabis in the United States. 
and arguing that it really should be decriminalized because not only are you know college students using it, but so are rich people in New Orleans who are enjoying it at a garden party, rich people in Boston who are enjoying it at a dinner party. It has permeated the national consciousness. It has become something that is, uh, you know, around, still somewhat avant-garde, but generally accepted by everyone from Allen Ginsberg, you know, well-known national poets, to rich white people at Boston dinner parties. And this makes one individual in particular incredibly uncomfortable. And his name is Richard Nixon. I'm not going to go to the next slide just yet. So Nixon is fascinating. I can't quite get enough of Richard Nixon. He runs for president in 1968 and wins rather decisively. And he runs on the platform of, I'm sure that this doesn't now, but law and order. He promises to crack down on those elements of society that he sees as flouting the rules uh, of people who are not abiding by what he deems to be normative American culture. And he particularly sees this in the rising counterculture that is fundamentally opposed to the war in Vietnam, fundamentally supportive of civil rights, and fundamentally opposed to the presidency of Richard Nixon. Nixon cannot quite understand or figure out a way to crack down on dissent. You can't arrest people for protesting. That's our First Amendment right. But you can arrest people for drug use which is why he was such a proponent for the Controlled Substances Act, which was signed on October 27th of 1970, about you know, a, year and a, a year and a half, almost two years into his first term. You're probably familiar with the Controlled Substances Act. Uh, it's incredibly influential as far as national uh, drug policy is concerned. Prior to the passage of the CSA in 1970, laws surrounding marijuana were basically a patchwork. Um, they were state-based. They were certainly harsher in some places than others. Uh, for example, Texas was very punitive about uh, marijuana possession. Other states like Oregon were slightly looser. But nonetheless, there was no blanket uh, policy that related to this drug nationwide. The CSA changed that. And making possession and distribution of marijuana federal offense. Most drugs are prosecuted on the state level, not the federal level. But nonetheless, this was an incredibly important rhetorical and indeed policy based uh, change. You also probably know the CSA because it puts illicit drugs and illicit drugs into five schedules. From one to five, they go from the most dangerous to the uh, sort of most widely accepted drugs. And that's based on two categories. The first is the level of medical usage of the substance, and the second is its potential for abuse. And so you can see here in this beige rectangle that Schedule One drugs, which are considered the most dangerous, have no established medical usage, claims that they cannot be used safely, and they have the greatest potential for abuse. And these drugs include heroin, LSD, mescaline, peyote, methoqualone, psilocybin, and there it is, marijuana. Now, Nixon pushes incredibly hard to have marijuana included in, in uh, Schedule One. And actually, before I go on, I should note, too, that one of the biggest shifts about the CSA is that if you're going to discuss the established medical uses, usage of a drug, one might assume that a doctor would be in charge of this because they would know the most about medical usage and whether or not it can be used safely or not. But the big change as well about the CSA is that Nixon doesn't put, say, the uh, Surgeon General in charge of this. He puts the Attorney General in charge of determining which substances go into which schedule. That's a huge shift. And in the photo of Nixon signing the CSA there in 1970, the man uh, to his left, our right, holding the document is his Attorney General, John Mitchell, who is as firmly opposed to marijuana as Nixon was, and was now in control of determining which drugs would fit into which schedule. 
So if you're wondering where <laughs> drugs sometimes escape the medical realm and go into the judicial or policy or punitive realm, it really does kind of start with the CSA and putting the attorney general in charge of these uh, determinations. Nixon and Mitchell lobby Congress very, very hard to have marijuana uh, included in Schedule One. And Congress, which is a little bit more suspicious of like, well, really, is it at the same level as heroin and, you know, psilocybin and things like that? They're suspicious, but they agree to temporarily put pot into Schedule One pending the results of something else that the CSA set up, which was the National Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse, which is also known as the Schaefer Commission. The Schaefer Commission lasted from 1970 to 1972, and it was named after the man holding the document with Richard Nixon in the middle of the, uh, the, middle of the image there, uh, Raymond P. Schaefer, who is the former governor of Pennsylvania. He was a Republican. He was hand-selected by Nixon because Schaefer was going for a federal judgeship after the Schaefer Commission was finished and was sort of hoping that by working with Nixon on this thing, Nixon would appoint him and he could then go on and turn his career into that. Uh, there were 13 members total. Not all of them are uh, featured in this image. They were given a $1 million budget, which is about $6.8 million today, to enact a two-year study on the scopes and breadth of cannabis use in the United States. This is a really remarkable period in American history that the federal government would fund uh, deep, in-depth research into the use of this drug. And Nixon does it almost exclusively for selfish reasons. He is hoping that by dangling a federal judgeship in front of, in front of Raymond Schaefer, the Schaefer Commission would find evidence that would support Nixon's theory that marijuana was essentially tearing apart the fabric of the United States and was a terrible drug and was the reason why so many people disliked his administration and him. So he's hoping that the Schaefer Commission will find that uh, pot smokers are more dangerous, more violent, they're less likely to abide by other laws, they are less likely to pursue righteous, upstanding jobs or education, things like that. And that's what he's really kind of gunning for. And that would, of course, also keep marijuana in Schedule One. Two years later, however, by the time the Schaefer Commission finishes its report, none of the things that Nixon was hoping for are within that report at all. And you can essentially see, you know, a TLDR, you know, too long didn't read, um, evidence of what, of what their findings were in the very title of their report, which is Marijuana, a Signal of Misunderstanding. They found nothing that Nixon wanted after interviewing numerous people traveling around the world to find other cultures that use cannabis they essentially found that there was no real difference between users and non-users of the drug. Non-users and users were no more lazy or violent or whatever than each other. They found, similar to the reports that James R. White had uh, unearthed previously, that pot was less dangerous than other legal drugs. They also found that they, uh, during this period from 1970 to 1972, there is a massive uh, national problem with heroin use. The Schaefer Commission is arguing that those uh, harder drugs are, should absolutely be the uh, federal focus for drug policy and treatment, not marijuana. And they ultimately come down on the side of arguing for decriminalization of cannabis, not legalization, but decriminalization nationwide. And I also want to note very briefly that the one woman in this photo is named Joan Gans Cooney, who is absolutely fascinating because she is the executive director of the Children's Television Workshop, and she was responsible for getting Sesame Street on the air. So if you ever wanted to know if there was a connection between Sesame Street and the history of cannabis in the United States, that woman is who you go to. <laughs> so naturally, Nixon hates the Schaefer Report. There's this great editorial cartoon uh, from 1973, Nixon leaning over his desk in the Oval Office as someone's trying to bring in the final report saying, don't confuse me with facts. Nixon wants to believe what he believes about pot. No one's gonna change his mind. He refuses to take cannabis out of Schedule One just because of uh, a couple of findings of the Schaefer Commission. 
And he basically denies the findings to the press. He hardly talks about it. He uh, kind of misreads it and says, I don't believe that it should be legalized. This is terrible. And naturally, Raymond P. Schaefer does not get uh, his federal judgeship either. He tries to bury the report, but it doesn't work because as you can see here on this previous slide, uh, this is actually a cover of the sort of you know, pocket paperback edition of the report, which on the top, if you can read it, it's a little blurry. It says it costs $1.25. <laughs> so it's incredibly accessible. It's incredibly cheap. It's actually a very dense read um, for anyone looking for you know, how marijuana was being viewed in the 1970s. It gives an excellent sort of uh, snapshot of the time. And I, you know, for the most part, understandings of the drug doesn't get too much better. They're very thorough in their research. But it becomes very popular, it becomes widely available, and it will go on to influence state policy um, in the coming years. So before we discuss that, we have to discuss what is also happening in Washington, D.C. while Nixon is arguing against the Schaefer Commission's report. And that is the formation of the first national marijuana rights lobbying group, also in Washington, D.C., called NORML, or the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. It's founded by this young man right here named Keith Strop, who is actually still very actively involved uh, with the organization 50 years later. And uh, Normal is still based here in DC. And it's a really remarkable organization because of who Strop was and what his interests were. Uh, Strop was from Illinois and came to Washington to pursue his law degree at Georgetown. When he finished, it was uh, the height of the Vietnam War, he did not want to be drafted, and he found that he could uh, defer his draft by working for Ralph Nader and his Commission on Consumer Rights. He was really influenced by Nader, who was uh, an incredibly eloquent and provocative speaker who said that consumers have a right to be protected uh, from dangerous products like cars that could explode, clothing that could light on fire, and all these other various products that were being sold with no oversight, no regulation, and no element of education on the part of the consumer that said, you know, this is, you know, this product is safe, this product is unsafe, et cetera. When he finishes working for Nader's commission, uh, he's no longer at risk of being drafted. Uh, it's 1970, the war is winding down, or at least the draft is, and he's not entirely sure what to do with it. Like, but by this point, he is also a research user. And he realized the concept that Nader was using to defend consumers from defective cars or clothing or appliances could actually be directed to cannabis as well. Strop really saw for the first time that cannabis users could be seen as consumers rather than criminals. And a lot of the language we hear today for legalization, Strop was saying 50 years ago, which I find really, really uh, unique and, and remarkable. He was saying that this is a drug that, you know, the federal government is trying to criminalize, but he's also kind of sensing the tenor of the times and knew that the Schaefer Commission was going, you know, there was movement towards decriminalization, saying that uh, cannabis users are using their drug of choice in the privacy of their own homes, they're not hurting anyone. They deserve to be protected from uh, defective drugs. From they deserve to have access to uh, 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 you know commercial substance that is regulated, that is produced uh, in healthy ways. That would be you know like any other product. If you go to the grocery store, you would get something that has gone through various levels of ensuring its safety. And he wanted to see cannabis undergo those sort of same rigorous. Uh, checks on the supply. And again, this is the language that we hear today. So while Normal is doing this on Capitol Hill, um, and he's also very, he's really trying to ensure that his representation of cannabis advocacy and, lo and lobbying is seems professional. He always wears a suit and a tie. He goes to individual lawmakers' offices and he's very uh, eloquent. He has his law degree and he's really trying to make uh, cannabis advocacy seem incredibly professional. So while he's pushing for federal change in Washington, D.C., across the states, 
as more people read the Schaefer Commission's report in paperback form, they're starting to change laws at the state level. And between 1973 and 1978, a wave of decriminalization laws spread across the country. It starts in Oregon in 1973. And in my book, I go through the story of a really remarkable activist who was so inspired by his hatred for Richard Nixon uh, and this belief that, you know, from the 1960s, this movement for the personal being political, uh, he and a lot of other people, a lot of other young people, decided to take the movement of the counterculture from the 1960s and turn it into policy. Uh, they ran for state legislatures in 1972, and waves of young people get elected in, 19, in that year. And by 1973, we start to see some laws enacted um, in various areas that regard the use of drugs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oregon is the first. Steve Kofori is the activist who gets elected to uh, the state house there. And he's the one who says, the Schaefer Commission's report recommends this. Let's put it into action. Let's decriminalize the possession of up to an ounce of marijuana in this state, turning it into essentially a civil fine, be like getting a speeding ticket or something like that. Whereas before it was a slightly more punishable uh, a violation. Oregon passes this, uh, actually overwhelmingly. So the state, uh, the state legislature is actually quite supportive of this. And Strop and the rest of the country kind of hold their breath and see if the sky will fall. A year later, Normal funds a huge statewide survey asking what the effects of decriminalization in Oregon have been. And it is overwhelmingly popular. Uh, the population of Oregon is very, very happy with the state of decriminalization. And that's when the floodgates open quite a bit. And you start to see three states uh, decriminalized in 75, three in 76, four in 77. Alaska gets an asterisk because it didn't just change the cannabis law, it actually amended its state constitution to decriminalize the drug. So it's slightly different. And so it gets a little notation there. And a lot of these states are surprising. Um, some of them essentially look like the map of legalization today. You have a lot of the West Coast, you have Maine, uh, some of, and Colorado, and some of them are surprising. You have Mississippi, you have North Carolina, you have Minnesota, which is of course, as Luke was saying, uh, is in the news right now. But there's this groundswell of support for decriminalization in that a dozen states pass it, they contain a third of the population, and people like Keith Straub and other decriminalization activists really think, we're on to something here. And nationwide decriminalization and possibly even legalization are just around the corner. They're feeling really good about their, about their crusade. However, alongside these changes in state laws, the growing acceptance of marijuana use also, also births something else, which is a booming popular culture surrounding the drug. You can see here on the right, uh, that's actually the first edition of High Times Magazine, which is still being published today. Summer 1974, cost a dollar. Uh, it was published by Tom Forsad, who is a counterculture activist out of Arizona. And it was kind of a, a spoof of Playboy in that the centerfold was not um, a naked woman. It was, uh, you know, it was, it was cannabis. It was some flower. Um, there were articles about, obviously, Leary's Ultimate Trip, I mean, about Timothy Leary, Marijuana Wonder Drug, A Lady Dealer Talk, Market Quotations. It was the first magazine that really accepted the drug culture. It became the voice of the drug culture. It spawned numerous copycat magazines, and it really became the voice of Normal as well. High Times partnered with Normal very early on and used uh, its wide circulation to promote Normal's agenda and the agenda of state-based decriminalization activists as well. But of course, a magazine is funded not only through subscriptions, but through advertisements. And you can see a couple examples of the advertisements uh, to the left and center of, of the screen. And not only were like magazines being promoted really heavily in the cannabis pop culture of the 70s, but there was a booming paraphernalia market. It was 
huge. I, I can't quite overestimate just how huge the paraphernalia market was. You could buy things uh, through the mail. You could, you know, you could order the, the catch a buzz, the buzz bee, which is a frisbee with a little pipe in the middle. So you could literally uh, puff, puff, pass. Um, or you could go to head shops. Paraphernalia was being sold at record stores. It was being sold at 7-Elevens. It was being sold uh, at convenience shops. Paraphernalia was everywhere. And it was a huge industry. By 1977, paraphernalia is pulling in about $250 million a year. In 1977, marijuana, out, marijuana paraphernalia outgrosses the first Star Wars film. That's how huge the industry is. It has, you know, there's giant conventions and convention centers. Uh, everybody's getting onto it. You know, everyone from large paraphernalia companies like Adam's Apple in Chicago to people whittling wooden pipes in their garage and running an advertisement in high times are trying to get on this because the United States is also undergoing a recession. And this is one of the few booming economies of the time. But it presents a problem right? because a lot of these products don't seem <laughs> intended solely for adults, right? You have the Frisbee, you have clowns advertising rolling papers saying, get high with a friend. There was uh, uh, bongs that looked like spaceships. There was something called the power hitter, which gave you a really strong uh, hit of smoke, but it looked like a baseball. There were things that looked like toys. And they were also really easy to buy. Uh, any kid could walk into a head shop or a 7-Eleven and buy a Star Wars themed bong without any questions asked. This is obviously an issue. And the unregulated popularity of paraphernalia and marijuana use births the drug's own counter revolution. Because by 1978 and 1979, rates of adolescent marijuana use peak in the United States with about one in nine high school seniors saying that they're smoking every day, and children as young as 13 saying that the drug is really easy to get. And that becomes a huge problem for the industry. The counter-revolution counter at birth is called the parent movement, which lasted from about 1976 to its heyday ended in about 1992. Uh, there are still some elements of it alive today. And it began in 1976 at the backyard birthday party of a 12-year-old girl in the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia. Parents, Peers, and Pot, which is that book in the middle there, uh, the sort of yellowed one, was written by the woman there on the left in red named Marcia Schuhard, whose nickname was Keith, also like Keith Strop. There's a lot of Keiths in the history of cannabis in the United States. She was the daughter, or she was the mother of the young girl who she realized was smoking pot and drinking wine with her friends in their backyard birthday party for her. And she was terrified of this, not only because her kid was doing something that she really didn't understand, but because she feared that there was so little understanding of the impact of cannabis on adolescent bodies at the time that she worried that her daughter living in this uh, sort of booming drug culture that was the mid-1970s in the United States, that her daughter was essentially a guinea pig uh, in service for the larger drug culture, the people who were advertising in high times who are now trying to make a buck off of enticing her daughter essentially to vice. She was horrified about this. She was terrified about this. Uh, but like uh, James White before her, she was also a researcher. And so she went to the federal government's information. She tried to find everything she could about the dangers of marijuana. She mostly found uh, articles similar to what White found that were essentially supportive of decriminalizing the drug. And she became very concerned. She also started looking around and realizing that this drug culture was flourishing underneath her nose and she wasn't really paying attention to it. You know, the toys that looked like, you know, simple innocent toys to her were actually drug paraphernalia. Uh, she started listening more closely to lyrics of songs and references in movies and realizing that there was this drug pop culture that she worried was like the Pied Piper luring children to drug use. She's also very inspired by a second wave feminism and consciousness raising groups. So shortly after her daughter's birthday party, 
she went to all the parents of the kids who attended and asked them to come to a meeting in her living room where they would talk about their children's drug use and try to figure out something to do about it. And that was essentially the birth of the first parent group, which is a very grassroots sort of take charge of your own family and your own community idea that says parents of children who are either using drugs or at risk of using drugs should get together and combine forces, you know, enforce curfews, give kids alternative activities, and really try to protect their community and their children from the, you know, this invasion of, of the drug culture. And she found that it worked very, very well for her wealthy white suburban community. What a surprise. And together with Thomas Gleaton, who is a professor at Georgia State University, they formed PRIDE, the Parents Resource Institute on Drug Education, uh, housed at Georgia State, where they began sending out information about the dangers of marijuana use to parents who were interested. She was actually hired by NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, to write uh, Parents, Peers, and Pot, which was her first uh, sort of pro-family group, anti-marijuana, how to form your own parent group guidebook, um, which became one of the most popular publications uh, NIDA had ever printed. Over a million copies were requested. And there were numerous other groups that started forming in the vein of pride, like National Families in Action, which focused on lobbying state legislatures to ban adolescent access to paraphernalia. And basically, within a couple of years, from 1976 to 1980, through emphasis, uh, emphasize, emphasis on education, on lobbying, on huge um, organizations that have uh, their huge conferences that were bringing people together. There were parent groups in every state. There were over 3,000 of them, and they were starting to really dominate the conversation about, uh, about marijuana use in the United States. By 1980, they're gaining so much traction and influence that they're able to form their own national lobbying group right over the border from Washington, D.C. in Silver Spring, Maryland, called the National Federation of Parents for Drug-Free Youth. The NFP is incredibly important because their position is that parents can't do this alone. They have to have assistance from the federal government. And in November of 1980, when Ronald and Nancy Reagan come to the White House, or win the White House, they are perfectly aligned to have an incredibly powerful level of support uh, on Capitol Hill. Nancy Reagan is probably the person you think of the most when you think of anti-drug activism, uh, you know, opposition to uh, adolescent drug abuse in the 1980s. She was the face of the movement. But in 1980, when her husband was first elected, she was not that individual. It's hard to express just how unpopular Nancy Reagan was in 1980 and 1981. Uh, she was called in the Los Angeles Times, quote, a frivolous social climber with more political ambition than Lady Macbeth. Right. She was seen as someone who was completely out of touch with Americans as people were struggling with the recession and high unemployment. She was seen as a person who was more interested in the state of the White House China than the state of the American family. Uh, she had gone to Princess Diana's and Prince Charles's wedding at great expense. Her $10,000 uh, inauguration ball gown was seen as an affront to struggling families. No one liked her. <laughs> So she needed a platform that would make her seem more maternal and loving and concerned. And the parent movement saw this as their major opportunity. So they immediately start working with uh, her closest advisor, get her on board, and she becomes the leading supporter of parent activists uh, in the United States and abroad. She also becomes the voice, obviously, just you know, uh, actually stealing it uh, and whitewashing it from an African American grandmother named Joan Brand, who in or originated the clubs in Oakland, California. Uh, and I'd love to go more into that, but that's chapter 10 of my book. If you want to go, in, if you want to find out more. So, what essentially happens in the 1980s with the relationship between parent activists and the uh, and the and the Reagans is that. The argument that Keith Strop and decriminalization act 
activists were putting out there in the 70s gets turned on its head. No longer is cannabis use about an adult who uses substance in the privacy of their own home. Now the argument is that children have a right to go drug free and drug using adults are an affront and a threat to that right. That makes punishing adult users much more palatable to the American public. All decriminalization laws are wiped off the books during the Reagan administration, and there is a greater push to punish drug users. And this is particularly important in 1986 when a new drug comes on the scene, which is crack cocaine. Crack, of course, had been used before, usually combining, uh, it was called freebasing, you know, being able to turn a, a snortable substance into a smokable powder. Um, but by 1986, there is a glut of cocaine coming up from South Africa and the technique to make it smokable um, was sort of like finessed and finalized. And there was so much of it that you could sell crack for really amounts of money, five, ten dollars. When Len Bias and Don Rogers die within two weeks of each other in uh, summer of 1986, they were uh, very well-known athletes. Washington goes bananas, and it kind of loses its mind. Uh, crack becomes the biggest threat to the American public um, seemingly ever. There is nonstop reporting about it that is very demonizing to the drug and drug users. The 1986 Anti-Drug Abuse Act is passed, which is where we get that 100 to 1 sentencing disparity for possession of crack versus powder cocaine. There's fears about crack, like crack babies and crack kids. If the mother smoked, the children are a uh, permanent bio underclass, which is a term that was used. Uh, and there's a celebration of CBS News, 48 hours on crack street, police busting into homes, police busting into apartments and arresting drug users. It completely erases marijuana from the headlines. We have a new boogeyman to fear and crack becomes the source of the punitive war on drugs um, that we really know today. But what, I, what also happens, which is surprising, is that crack's destruction of so many lives and total uh, control of headlines in the United States allows for marijuana to undergo a kind of renaissance. Crack, of course, is not the only epidemic of the 1980s. There is also the HIV AIDS epidemic. And pot reemerges for the first time as a medicine, as opposed to just a scourge of, of adolescent safety. So here you see a couple of pictures of medical marijuana pioneers in American history. There is Robert Randall in the top left, who was the first person to be uh, federally recognized as a medical marijuana user for his glaucoma. And then Brownie Mary in the center and Dennis Perron in the right, who were based in San Francisco and began using uh, marijuana leaf brownies to help individuals in the Castro district who were suffering from HIV AIDS uh, and really didn't have a whole lot of other options for treatment. Uh, in the late 1980s, the drug was considered, um, excuse me, the, the disease was considered something that only affected people in the United States that were that no one really cared about, right? Gay men, intravenous drug users, the quote unquote dregs of society. Perron was a gay activist. Uh, Brownie Mary lived in the Castro and loved her gay neighbors. And they wanted to take care of the individuals they saw essentially dying around them. And so Brownie Mary would bake brownies. Dennis Perron would donate a lot of the, the weed. And together they would give these brownies to uh, people who were suffering from HIV quell some of their nausea, relieve some of their pain, give them a little bit of an appetite. And they became the faces of the medical marijuana movement because they made it seem so sympathetic. They're, this was not drug use just to uh, be intoxicated, just to get high. This was something that was helping individuals for whom nothing else helped. And this transformed the reputation and uh, sort of imagination surrounding marijuana for the first time since the parent movement had demonized it about a decade prior. And by 1996, California becomes the first state to legalize medical marijuana, allowing a doctor to recommend, not prescribe, but recommend its use. Afterwards, loads of states follow. As Luke said, we now have 33 that have medical marijuana laws on the books. 
And it became this sort of revolution that redefined America's relationship with this drug that was no longer just an illegal drug we use for fun, but now a medicine that was used for glaucoma, cancer, AIDS, and numerous other um, illnesses. Did this change how many people were being arrested for the drug? No, it did not. Uh, Luke was saying that there were over, um, checking my notes here, what, eight, eight, 820,000 arrests in 2019. My notes here, of course, are from 2010. They're all from the AC, uh, ACLU. But as you can see, over 7 million people were busted 10 years ago, um, from 2001 to 2010. Uh, bust was made every 37 seconds. And in the two green squares, you can see that marijuana use among the races is fairly equal, but arrests are not overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly unequal arrests. This is obviously a problem, but again, because recreational marijuana use was illegal, not a lot of people made, paid attention to it. Until 2010, when this woman right here, Michelle Alexander, released her book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness, in which she argues that our America's punitive, uh, essentially war on drugs, has recreated segregation beyond the level of apartheid in South Africa by using drug laws and low-level crimes to incarcerate more African Americans in the United States than South Africa did as part of apartheid. This book also comes out in 2010. And while Alexander does not say that legalization of cannabis is a solution to racist policing, she does say that it is a potentially one way to help the issue. States jump onto this as well, and activists across the country see Alexander's book and legalization as one potential step, concrete step that people could take to, you know, level the playing field a little bit, at least in this one area. And in 2012, we see the passage of the first recreational legalization laws in Colorado and Washington. These follow up in 2014 in Alaska. Oregon and Washington, D.C. This is the poster from the D.C. Cannabis Campaign where you can see quite clearly the connection to Alexander's argument. It says legalization and discrimination, vote yes on 71. In 26, four more states follow, or 2016, excuse me, four more states follow, Nevada, Massachusetts, Maine, and California. And in 2018 and 2019, Illinois, Michigan, and Vermont also follow suit. So here we are, we go back to this map of uh, legalization and criminalization in the United States. And a lot of what people predicted when they were fearful of legalization hasn't happened. Um, first of all, legalization hasn't really spread like wildfire and we'll discuss why in a minute. But the fears about legalization that all of a sudden, like in the 1970s, teens would start smoking pot in record numbers, kids would have access to it, that hasn't happened either. And that is because the legalization laws of the past decade have learned from the mistakes of the past. You know, legalization has regulations and control on it that simply aren't available in decriminalization. If you go to a dispensary in a legalized state, your ID gets checked. If you're underage, you are not allowed to go in. There are protective measures that ensure that it's only for adults. Uh, which of course does not happen in either decriminalized states or of course on the black market. But legalization also has hardly cured racism. Uh, even in legalized states, black people are more likely to get arrested for possession than whites. The business side is overwhelmingly white. It is controlled by rich white people, uh, even though there are all of these um, advocates for social justice that argue that the communities most harmed by the impacts of drug laws should be the ones who benefit the most from legalization. And there are a lot of states struggling with how to walk the talk about social justice in legalization, which is why states like New Jersey and New York are, they just haven't been able to fine tune the legislation enough to pass the law um, in a way that makes advocates very happy. There's also a small backlash that has occurred. There are some new parent groups. Um, the black market, of course, is still alive and well. Jeff Sessions, uh, Trump's first attorney general, of course, was famously opposed to legalization and tried to overturn the Cole memo that allowed 
legalization to occur at the state level without federal interference. And there's authors like Alex Berenson, whose book, uh, Tell Your Children, continues to try to associate marijuana use with violence. But the problems of the past also haven't popped up. So legalization in many ways has cured some of the problems of the past while also creating new ones because in the 1970s, we really weren't talking about racial justice in terms of Canada. So what will the future hold? Um, I certainly predict that it will be hard to put the genie back into the bottle. I do not think that legalization laws on the state level will be overturned easily. But I also think that the industry really has to guard itself so that it doesn't reify the same structures of white supremacy that it was argued that legalization was effectively created to dismantle. I think talking about legalization right now in terms of racial justice is an incredibly important conversation to have given everything that we're discussing uh, right now that's going on in the country. And I hope that um, if you have any questions about that, we can talk about it. And I hope that this was even moderately useful in understanding the longer history of uh, cannabis activism in the United States. So I will close out this and hopefully I can see your, so I can see your questions. Um, and I'd love to have more of a conversation about this. Thank you, Emily. It was uh, very useful. It was very stimulating. Thanks so much for doing this. Sure. Uh, uh, as the questions start to roll in, I guess I just wanted to throw the first one at you, which is um, one thing that didn't pop up, or a couple of words that I thought were going to pop up didn't, which is reefer madness. <laughs> and uh, so reefer madness, um, sort of maybe, can you say a little bit about sort of the the debate, long debate about reefer madness, and, and perhaps how it's connected to um, uh, concerns about big marijuana and, and corporatism nowadays. So how is the industry coping uh, or not coping? Um, and the industry could be recreational, or it could be, um, or it could be the medical industry. How you know how is this being negotiated? That's a great question. So the history of reefer madness goes back certainly long before um, legalization, recreational legalization was something we had to consider. But it goes back to 1936, um, based off of a film that was produced by a church group. Um, and it was called Reefer Madness or Tell Your Children. And it showed um, a group of young people consuming cannabis and then essentially losing their minds. It was a very uh, prohibitionist film that warned that uh, cannabis use would immediately lead to madness, suicide, and of course one of the biggest uh, concerns was miscegenation, uh, uh, you know, a mixing of the races in relationships. Um, and this idea that cannabis is tied to these problems is rampant, right? That, that pot leads to madness. This was a huge um, argument that was supported by Harry Anslinger, who is the leader of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics for 32 years until 1962 or so. And this mantle has been taken up by numerous others um, as time has gone on. Not necessarily by the parent movement, which I think is interesting. They're just saying kids shouldn't use drugs, which is something, of course, that the legalization proponents today agree with, um, which is why I think their arguments are more powerful than they were in the 1970s. But now we see other people like Alex Berenson, who I, who I mentioned before, whose book, Tell Your Children, is based off of the title of Reefer Madness, who is again warning that uh, cannabis leads to mental instability, that if you have uh, schizophrenia, it will become more powerful, it will lead to violence, all of this stuff. And there is a fear that uh, Berenson plays up that through legalization and through a more intensified form of corporatization and commercialization, the products will get more powerful. Uh, the THC levels will rise. You will get, you know, a thousand milligram THC chocolate bars, which which you which you can get for good or for ill. Yeah. Those are available, and that more intensive um, or access to more intensive, uh, more powerful drugs will lead to greater problems. This is not something that I think. Cannabis companies should ignore if they want to move forward and continue to really be accepted by uh, the larger culture. Um, for the most part, when I when I've looked in dispensaries and I've looked at products, 
and I've talked about tenders, which is a great term. Um, <laughs> they're always very, they're always very, um, they really warn people to, you know, start slow or start low and go slow. Do not take too much. Do not overwhelm your system. These products are potent. These are these products are powerful. You know, don't take too much, et cetera, et cetera. Which I think is a really great way to respond to these complaints. As far as the products simply being available, I mean, you can also buy Everclear at the liquor store. You can also, you know, buy whiskey and things like that. Again, the genie can't get put into the bottle again, but there is a process of consumer education, ongoing consumer education, that I think any cannabis company would be wise to participate in in order to thwart or deflect these ideas of reefer madness. Cool. Yeah, no, I I just can't help but think about the rise of quote unquote big marijuana and how it's negotiating um, some of these these issues. And before I turn over to Greg though, Emily, can I ask you just one final question? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean part of the part of the um sort of the underlying motive for establishing this uh seminar was to get different um awesome researchers talking about their specific specialization, but then maybe connecting them to other parts of the world. Mm. Um, so with respect to the parents' movement, can you say a little bit about how it fit into uh, wider global discussions or, or, or not? Um, was it isolated? Was it talking to uh, branches around the world? It was. It was uh, particularly pride. They tried really hard to have a global conversation about the role that uh, parents could play in preventing their children from, you know, using drugs, from accessing drugs, things like that. That was one aspect of the conversation, but it ended up becoming by the mid 1980s when Pride was really thriving and had support from Nancy Reagan. It ended up becoming a larger conversation about the role that American children actually played as examples for children across the world. Keith Shuhart and Thomas Gleaton and, and even Nancy Reagan were getting up at these huge conferences Pride put on every year and said, you know, you children of America, if you uh, stay away from drugs and you, you know, become these good paragons of virtue, <laughs> uh, you can become examples for kids across the world who look up to America and, and, and look to Americans for, for guidance and for inspiration, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They were saying that, you know, children in um, Colombia whose, you know, lives are being disrupted by the coca trade or whatever, uh, they look to American kids. And if American kids seem like they're not going to use these drugs, that they're, you know, they're going to be examples of how to, I mean, essentially how to behave in a way that the, the Reagan mm. administration found very, very uh, compelling toward its family, family values, uh, conservative, like a compassionate conservative stance. So mm. it was using kids essentially as, as weapons in a larger culture wars that they were trying to then promote on a global scale. Kind of devious, really. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Greg, are there questions that uh, folks out there um, are asking? Yes, there certainly are. Uh, before I get to the questions, I thought I would mention that we've had 70 participants today, so a uh, very popular topic. And we've been getting questions throughout the presentation, which is very, very nice to see. A couple questions related to the economics that you've talked about, Dr. Dufton. Sure. Uh, Greg Higby, the former executive director of the American Institute of Pharmacy, asked, uh, is it true that big tobacco companies are poised to enter the cannabis marketplace once legalization takes place? And a similar question from Betty Tuning, a uh, professor at the UW School of Pharmacy. Uh, she says that it seems so obvious to legalize marijuana for economic reasons, as I argued in Colorado. Uh, she was wondering about the impact of this economic argument. So a couple questions about the economics of legalization. Absolutely. Yes, big tobacco is poised to move into the cannabis here, as are, uh, interestingly enough, alcohol companies who are really interested in THC and CBD-infused beverages. Um, it's a very logical place for them to go. Uh, fewer people are smoking tobacco. Um, actually, there are even some declines in alcohol consumption, maybe not after lockdown and quarantine anymore, but um, there are a lot of people moving. There are a lot of large corporations very interested in moving into the cannabis Year, which should become, frankly, as, as no surprise. As far as the economic benefits of, of 
legalization, they are multitude. And that is one of the, the two most powerful arguments for state-based legalization is money, right? If you tax this drug and it's taxed very highly, um, usually on several levels, you have money that you can put towards other things, especially as states are constantly cutting taxes. Here's a place to actually generate revenue uh, in a brand new way that people are willing to pay because they don't want to be in the black market anymore. So uh, Colorado, I think, uses the money to fund schools, especially school construction, and of course, um, anti-drug education and things like that. It also goes even to uh, state-based public health initiatives, um, including like access to dentistry for um, low-income folks. It's a really fascinating way to raise money. But of course, the secondary, and I would say more emotionally powerful argument for legalization is that social justice initiative. So it's money and it's social justice, and they are two sides of the same coin as far as support for legalization is concerned. Yes, absolutely. Uh, a similar question just came in as you were answering that from uh, Romeo Alonzo. He was wondering uh, if you could speak on big aggers involvement in this, uh, in the cannabis industry, cultivation, uh, the equipment and the nutrients manufacturing, sort of a different angle of the legalization and the corporatization of marijuana. That's a great question, too, uh, and really an important one. For the most part, getting, getting licensed to become a grower and a distributor uh, in certain states, especially California, is incredibly expensive. And it has this emphasis on legalization and kind of a pay-to-play system has been very beneficial for large-scale growers and really damaging to the mom-and-pop growers that have been the backbone of the cannabis industry for decades, for, for half a century. Uh, so in California, for example, you see the Emerald Triangle of, um, darn, I'm forgetting the name of all the counties, but up north, uh, Mendocino is certainly one of them. I'm forgetting the others, Humboldt, and there's one more, darn. Uh, the Emerald Triangle of small mom and pop growers, sort of like this artisanal artisanal cannabis growers are going under. They simply cannot afford to be licensed by the state. Whereas these really large scale growers that can afford $100,000 or whatever it costs to get a license are poised to really take over the industry. Scott Miracle Grow is a company that is moving very heavily into the cannabis sphere because they offer products that help <laughs> the mass growth of, of really what is actually kind of a, a finicky plant. Um, pot will grow on a hillside somewhere, but if you're growing for a specific terpene profile or you want you know, an incredibly strong yield or whatever, you have to be very, very, you have to treat the, the plant like a colicky baby. You really have to be very careful with it. And uh, Scott Miracle Grow is moving into that sphere by you know, promoting its products to large scale growers who are growing on an industrial level. So again, that's something that States like New York and New Jersey are grappling with. They want to legalize. They know that it's the right thing to do, but they're trying to ensure that they're doing it in a way that uh, holds onto social justice initiatives and no long and does not overly conform or support uh, big agri industry interests as opposed to smaller um, farmers, uh, smaller growers who would really benefit from from this industry becoming legalized. Uh very, very interesting, complicated uh, topic as we're finding out. A lot of interest in the economic angle here. Uh, Timothy Harris asked the question, have you seen any evidence that the legalization of de or decriminalization of mar marijuana has significantly affected the number of black market sales? Nope, it sure hasn't. Black market remains alive and well, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is a problem when legalization is piecemeal as it has been uh, state by state. So um, I live, uh, actually, I don't live very far from the headquarters, the former headquarters of the NFP. I'm in uh, Maryland, right over the border from DC. DC is legalized in a very weird way where it did not, did not legalize sales, but you can gift it to someone. Maryland, it's still illegal, medical is fine. Um, but people who act, like if you go to DC and you go to a store where, where essentially you can buy products, they're all from California. Um, the bleed of products from legalized states to, Ill, to states where they're still criminalized means that the black market is going to continue to thrive. Uh, there's no stopping it. 
Um, even in legalized states, the black market continues to thrive because A, it'll sell to anyone, and B, the products are considerably less expensive. And if you're buying products that are made under the guise of legality, so you know that there is controls and uh, and you know sort of you know product product regulation going into it, you feel better about purchasing these things on the black market. Um, I do not see the black market being eradicated in the United States until legalization is at least in every state and is made much more affordable for the average consumer. But that will be difficult because in many ways it will uh, kind of it will kind of upset the fundamental basis of legalization, which is that these products are so expensive that kids can't buy them and that's, a, that's supposed to be a good thing. It's super, it's super complex. Uh, certainly, no question there. Uh, changing gears a little bit, Richard Stein asked, we've had a lot of discussion of decriminalization and the, uh, the unequitable enforcement of marijuana laws. Richard Stein is curious if crime rates have decreased in states that have legalized marijuana. I, I guess I would need some more information about what he's specifically asking. Like crime rates as far as arrests for possession and use of the drug or, or crimes as a whole. Um, I cannot answer, you know, I cannot speak towards crime rates as a whole, you know, property crimes, uh, hate crimes, things like that. As far as rates of arrests um, for possession, um, as I was talking about a little bit before, there's still prevalent um, in even legalized states, because for the most part, uh, states require you to consume the drug in the privacy of your own home. It's not something that can be done out and about, right? You, there's no bars. You can't uh, smoke on the street for it. You can't, you know, it's like you can't, you have to be inside a private residence in a place where it's accepted and kind of kept out of sight. That's not possible for a large segment of the population. Um, and in where I live in DC or where I, where I live close to, uh, about 25, 26% of the city is federal land. And mm -hmm. federal land uh, means that it abides by federal law, which of course is dictated by the CSA, which means that possession and use is still 100% uh, patently illegal. So rates of marijuana arrests um, have decreased slightly in legalized states, but are still prevalent. There are still ways to be arrested uh, for, for the possession and use of this drug. You can still manage it somehow. <laughs> Yeah, let me interject quickly. Um, and uh, I guess more of a, a fun question than anything else, but you know, what are you reading about cannabis these days? So what are the, what are the books that you're picking up and, and looking at? Oh, I have to admit that I, I am working on a new book project and it doesn't deal with cannabis, so I haven't been reading too much. Um, I've been mostly reading about uh, medication assisted treatment for opioid use disorder, which is, which is quite different. Mm -hmm. um, but I really love um, the work of Amanda Chicago Lewis. She is a really great um, investigative journalist who is on the cannabis beat. And she just had an article in the New York Times about the history of CBD, which was awesome. Can't recommend mm -hmm. that enough. Um, there are quite a few writers on point who do great stuff about the history of cannabis. So I'm always enjoying their work, the work of David Guva and Bob Beach. Um, and if anyone has any recommendations for things I should continue to look at, I'm always available for recommendations. <laughs> and can other people write for points as well? I would love to write for points. Uh, we are always open for contributors. If anyone has any interest in writing uh, something about history for a public facing audience, we are always available for you. And you can get in touch with me. Um, I believe my uh, email address is prominently on the website. So if you go to pointsadhs.com, you can find it and shoot me an email and we can talk about how we can get you published on the blog. That would be great. Brilliant. Excellent. And we just shared a slide that everyone should be able to see that has Dr. Dufton's contact information, Twitter and internet, her website, and also in contact information for AIHP. Uh, similar question to the one Luke just asked from Richard Del Rio down in Chicago. He, was, he asked before you mentioned if you've started on your, on your next book project, and he was wondering, <laughs> uh, even though your next project might not be on marijuana, what new questions do you think we need to be need to be studying or answering in the history of marijuana and cannabis? Oh, that's great. Um, actually, and my new book will be coming from the University of Chicago Press, so very appropriate that you are in Chicago too. Um, it, 
So my next book is the history of the development of uh, buprenorphine, methadone, and naltrexone for the treatment of um, opioid use disorder and their transformation from essentially a public health service um, in the 1960s and 70s into commercial products that are uh, really expensive and hard to access today. So again, really uplifting, <laughs> just not at all depressing stories. Um, the, the next questions to ask for the field, there are so many. Um, there's so, like, what I love about drug history is that you realize that something that seems simple, um, yes or no, black and white, is always so much more complicated uh, than it actually is. Uh, as far as cannabis is concerned, I would love to see more writing about the role of women. Um, women play really influential roles in this history. Uh, there's a great Instagram account called Women Grow, which celebrates women in the cannabis field um, that kind of like, discusses that. I'd love to see a history of, of women's roles in cannabis activism and cannabis legalization uh, because they're pretty well represented in the anti-legalization aspect of the history uh, for the parent movement. But I'd love to see the pro, the pro history, the pro cannabis history written. Um, obviously, the effects of social justice and legalization need to continue to be tracked and uh, monitored. Will legalization really make these effects, these, these necessary effects? Can cannabis be used as a cure for racism? At the moment, it doesn't seem like it's working that great. So we've put a lot of eggs into this basket. Um, will the return on investment be worth it? That is a book that absolutely needs to be tracked and written as well. Uh, we've got a lot of questions coming in. I apologize if we won't get to all the questions today. We're running close to the end, but a couple more questions. Uh, I apologize if I get some names wrong uh, with pronunciations, but uh, Nanduma Sarma has a couple questions. First, she wants to know if your slides will be available after the presentation. I would like to mention that this recording will be posted on AIHP's YouTube channel and on the Criminar website. It will be embedded there so you can watch the uh, the video of the presentation, which is also curious, your slides will be will, will be shared after the presentation. And she asks, uh, in the early days of cannabis, if there were concerns about super potent or sub potent products, uh, concerns about the quality of the cannabis in the 60s and 70s, like there are now. Yes, absolutely. Uh, parents were terrified in the 1970s that pot was so much stronger than it had been even in the 60s. So this is an argument you hear time and time again. Uh, but I would argue that today potency really is quite clearly more powerful than it was in the 1960s and 1970s. And that's because, um, as Michael Pollan argued um, in, what am I blanking on his book? Well, anyway, the one that only tracks like the fourth, like apple, cannabis, whatever else, that there is no plant that has been so carefully tended to, so carefully uh, so carefully um, cultivated as cannabis. We've become somewhat obsessed with this drug and turning it into the most powerful and most pleasurable uh, we can possibly make it. So the massive amount of interest in it and uh, sort of tending to it has created these products that are, you, you, you couldn't get a thousand milligram THC chocolate bar in 1979. It was not available, but it is available today, not only in uh, recreational dispensaries, but actually more so in the medical dispensaries for people who really need that kind of potency to help with, uh, you know, cancer, glaucoma, things like that. But yeah, this has been, uh, people have feared the most potent pot available for 50 years. <laughs> uh, it certainly seems like uh, a lot of these patterns are repeating themselves as you, as you document in your book with the ups and downs. Uh, Greg Higby has another question about the regulation of marijuana. He was curious about the Obama administration's lack of or decision not to move marijuana or cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2, if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, they, they did not move it. Uh, obviously, it remains a Schedule 1 substance today. Instead, what they put out was called the Cole Memo. And Cole, uh, I think his first name was Robert, he was an assistant attorney general. And he wrote a memo, which of course has no legislative or policy uh, making impact whatsoever, but essentially said that as these states are going through legalization on their own level, if they did not, if they did not break any federal laws, if there was no interstate trafficking, um, if they did not grow on federal lands, if children still essentially avoided the drug, 
the federal government would not interfere with the execution of these state laws. And this was what Jeff Sessions was trying to overturn back in the beginning of 2017 after the Trump administration came into uh, power. Of course, Jeff Sessions did not last very long as Attorney General and uh, Bill Barr um, has bigger fish to fry than cannabis laws right now. Uh, including the gassing of protesters in Washington, D.C. Isn't that wonderful? Um, so the, the Obama administration set the precedent that the federal government was going to be very hands-off uh, and they were going to allow state laws to uh, sort of roll out as were, as, was, as were the wishes of the voters in those states. But they made no move to actually reschedule or anything like that. Rescheduling also is a process. Um, it requires uh, either massive congressional support, which doesn't exist at the moment, or it requires a lot of input from various federal agencies, including the DEA, the FDA, Health and Human Services, NIDA. It would require a groundswell of movement, action, and support from multi like a multitude of levels of federal officials that um, I think are more, I, I think they're happy to just allow State, uh, voters in, in separate states to do what they want to do because there's not enough energy in Washington to make any major changes on this issue right now. Uh, Dr. Dufton, I have to thank you uh, for giving us a wonderfully stimul stimulating paper. Um, it was truly enjoyable. Uh, so on behalf of all of the participants today, um, hopefully you'll come back and talk to us about uh, your next book when it's done. Yeah, just give me like a year or two. A year, two years? <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, oh. a, cu a couple of other housekeeping issues uh, for everyone, uh, everyone listening. Uh, so next week, uh, same time and same place, uh, Dr. Adam Rathji is going to talk to us about cannabis cures, medical jurisprudence, and the origins of the war on drugs. Um, if you've liked what you've heard here today, Please, by all means, uh, follow Dr. Dufton on Twitter. Uh, think about joining uh, AIHP, and by all means, think about um, subscribing to uh, the Points blog uh, that uh, Dr. Dufton edits. Um, please also think about sharing um, on, on Twitter and elsewhere uh, these talks. Um, you can see them after the fact on YouTube. Um, because, uh, as we believe here in Madison, uh, the more the merrier. Um, <laughs> so, again, thanks. Thanks so much, Dr. Dustin. And see you, Thank everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It was so much fun. I had a great time. <laughs>